Um, hi everyone, thanks for being here today. It's great to see such a great turnout. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Jay Pasikov is the Field Memorial Professor of Astronomy at Williams College, Director of the Hopkins Observatory there, and a visitor in the Department of Planetary Sciences here at Caltech. His ABAM and PhD were from Harvard, followed by postdocs there and at Caltech, and sabbaticals at Caltech, the Institute for Advanced Studies, the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. His primary studies have been of the solar atmosphere um, from the ground and from space. He has also in recent years been heavily involved with the occultation observations of the atmosphere of Pluto and of other objects in the outer solar system. Most recently, he's been involved in the observation of an occultation by NASA's New Horizons next target, the Kuiper Belt Object 2014 MU69. The August 21 event will be his 66th solar eclipse. So please give a warm welcome to our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these nice introductions. And thank you all for turning out. And I'm glad to see uh, some friends in the audience. And I hope we'll all be friends. Uh, and I hope we all get to see some good eclipses together. Uh, and uh, Michelle has her fingers properly crossed. So, so, that, so that will do it. Um, and, uh, and just to add to Michelle's crossed fingers, I'm going to show you some statistics of the cloudiness across the country <laughs> uh, uh, late, late, uh, later on. Uh, in any case, here's a, a picture, uh, actually, of an eclipse uh, with the Jupiter in the sky. And the eclipse phenomenon itself is small in the sky, smaller than you see in all those close-ups. So I'm going to try today to bring across some ideas of observing the eclipse and some ideas of what we see at an eclipse. Uh, but a main point I want to uh, to dwell on is the scientific observations we make at eclipses because there are a lot of, of misunderstandings that everything in space takes over from everything on the ground. And here at Caltech, we certainly know that isn't true. And it's not true for, uh, for solar uh, eclipse work, uh, the solar corona, any more than it's true for supernovae or, or other things that we study at, at Palomar or, or uh, with other major ground-based observatories. Uh, here is uh, an orientation of the, uh, of the eclipse here, and, uh, and, stresses, this is, uh, uh, and it stresses the uh, relative sizes of the, of the sun and the moon. You'll see, you'll see a better scale, but obviously we're, we're having a long, skinny shadow of the moon that's making an umbra uh, crossing the United States in a couple of hours, about two and a half hours, on the 21st of August. And only in this band, which goes from 60 to 71 miles across, do we have, uh, do we have totality. And outside, uh, we will just have a, a, a partial eclipse. Uh, so how many of you intend to go to the actual total eclipse uh, in this room? So that's a pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> so the others of you uh, who didn't raise your hand now realize that, that everybody else in the room thinks you're going to be missing something and, and change your plans and arrange to be in the path of totality. But you see, the moon is really quite far from the Earth. It is uh, also uh, 1 400th the size of the sun, but also uh, 400 times uh, uh, closer. So it's about the same size as the sun in the sky, plus or minus uh, uh, 10%. And, uh, and most months, the shadow goes above or below the uh, Earth because the lunar orbit is tilted about 5 degrees. But we are lucking into uh, it actually hitting the Earth uh, this, uh, this year. So I want to describe some of the research we've been doing uh, and, and in particular, I'm going to talk about an annular eclipse when the moon is a little too small to cover the sun because it's a little further than average. Uh, and I'm doing this in particular. Um, it's in various versions of my talk, longer, et cetera. Uh, but this one has a JPL connection. Um, so, so even though it's way back in 2012, um, uh, I want to say something about it. Uh, and, and at the VLA, for which, at which we had observing time in, uh, for this annular eclipse in 2012. And, oh, and an annulus is just a ring. So the moon's a little small, so there's a ring and annulus of sunlight 
around the sun. And whenever there are a few percent or even 1% uh, left, 1% of the average solar brightness is about 10,000 times brighter than, than the sky that we get during, uh, during a total eclipse. So even if you're in what's what they, they call a 99% eclipse, that's misleading because the sky is 10,000 times brighter than you want it to be to see all the eclipse phenomena. But in the radio astronomy, most of the radio radiation comes from active regions on the sun. And uh, we know the rate, of course, at which the moon is advancing across the sun, occulting the active regions so we can get very fine resolution uh, in just where the radio signals are coming from, finer even than the interferometric results we get from the VLA itself. So even if you're not in the 100% uh, 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 eclipse, all you need is the moon to cover the active regions. We did have that in, uh, in 2012. And of course, the VLA is this fantastic set of uh, radio telescopes. Uh, it was in a fairly compact array at the time. I had been teaching a uh, course at Williams College. Uh, we are an undergraduate institution. I had my, my whole uh, seminar in solar physics with me among the telescopes uh, uh, observing uh, while we use the, uh, the VLA itself, which, in which we, uh, there's a lower limit at which you can point it. And I was working with Dale Gary from the New Jersey Institute of Technology and Tim Bastian um, and, uh, and Stephen White. Uh, and Dale was, was also in charge of the Big Bear Solar Observatory, which used to be run by Alzheimer at Caltech when I was a postdoc at Caltech and now belongs to New Jersey Institute of Technology. So in any case, we have these results uh, in several channels. Here's about 3 gigahertz uh, of, of occultation there. We did have a number of octave regions. This is a magnetic field map with two opposite polarities here. And uh, so in 2012, I'll show you some graphs of the sunspot cycle later on. We had much higher solar activity than we had uh, this year. But uh, in any case, uh, we did observe the, um, the, well, the annular phase. A little cloud came in. Uh, but the radio uh, telescope isn't affected by that, and, and then we had the partial eclipse till, uh, till sunset. Uh, we, uh, as far as JPL is working, uh, they are part of the uh, Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope, um, uh, and I work especially with Tom Kuiper from, uh, uh, from JPL, and, uh, and the Lewis Center there uh, uh, made some observations, <coughs> they made some observations, and here are some <coughs> results at three and six, and and 8 and 14 gigahertz uh, mapping during the eclipse and, uh, and following the brightness as a function of, uh, of time at the different frequencies at 14 gigahertz. Uh, and Tom just put together some, uh, some scans that showed some of the active uh, regions there. And so we do plan to use um, Gavert again this year. And, uh, and also the expanded Owens Valley Solar Array. Here are some of the telescopes. Up in, the, uh, up in the Owens Valley. Um, and here's a, a map made with the new array, uh, uh, again, at a slightly more active time, a three gigahertz uh, map. And we have applied, again, for the VLA. Uh, I'm a co-investigator. Dale is the primary investigator. And we want to make the mapping of the sun from two to eight uh, gigahertz, preferably with a solar active region, and also some outreach. And we requested an eight-hour allocation. And just last week, less than a week ago, uh, we got a note that based on the review, uh, we, were, we grant the entire array for most of the time and some people who are studying the ionosphere for uh, some of the antennas in the, in the middle. So we have to bargain with them uh, a bit <laughs> to get back some of our antennas. But, uh, but we're very pleased to have the VLA uh, again for this mapping uh, on, uh, on August 21st. Uh, and now the eclipse. Uh, will be uh, only 75% uh, of the diameter, the magnitude is, is the percent of the diameter covered uh, at that time. We can call up a, a certain mapping program. These are all linked through uh, a website I run for the International Astronomical Union at eclipses.info. So I wanted the simplest URL to remember. So all these maps and things are linked through eclipses.info. And anyway, we have a magnitude 75% uh, at the VLA, so we have every chance of having any active regions on the sun occulted at that time. So let me go back uh, 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 to go to total solar eclipses. After that, later in 2012, there was a total solar eclipse that started in Australia. And we have uh, so much equipment. We, like to, we have to uh, be on uh, dry land. So we went as far 
uh, east as we could before the eclipse went over the ocean. And then I'll go on to an eclipse in Africa in 2013 and an eclipse in the Arctic in 2015, and then the most recent uh, total eclipse. Uh, so, here we, uh, so here we were at the edge of, uh, uh, of Australia. And on our original site, uh, it was unfortunately pretty cloudy. Um, so I was able to go up in a helicopter myself, <laughs> which we had standing by. Um, but, uh, but so here is the umbra, the shadow of the moon uh, coming, uh, coming across. And this beautiful view from the helicopter, we're seeing out of totality, oops, we're seeing out of totality um, the, uh, uh, while the uh, eclipse is going on, we're seeing the solar corona here, you can barely see the, it's overexposed, so you don't see too well, but the dark silhouette of the moon is there. But we, were, we did have the weather forecast, of course, as we will, just before August 21st this year. And, and we could see that it was going to be cloudy at that side. And I just had so many obligations, I had to stay. But we sent uh, some of our personnel and students uh, on the other side of a mountain range to Mount Carbine. And there it was very clear. Um, and uh, and we, uh, here's the diamond ring effect that many of you know is uh, the uh, last bead of sunlight shining through a valley on the edge of the moon. Uh, but what's new now is that within the last few years, the Japanese Kogoya satellite and the American Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter have mapped the, uh, the, the lunar topography in 3D. So now we can very accurately predict the, um, the uh, Bailey's beads and, in fact, use that to get a more accurate size for the sun uh, than, we, uh, than we had before. Here we see. Uh, cooler uh, gas uh, in Ejafa at the edge of the, uh, the uh, sun, the everyday uh, sun, the photosphere. And so these are the, this is uh, prominences and the chromosphere. And then you're seeing the inner corona here. And, uh, and here you're seeing uh, a little uh, more uh, beating here. The prominences here, a little more, uh, more corona. And, the th and uh, here's the diamond ring at the other side. And uh, one of the things about eclipse photography, for those of you who do it, is, is uh, every exposure is good. Uh, there's a difference of a factor of about a thousand in brightness from here to here. Uh, so, uh, so what you do is you make a series of, uh, of exposures. Here we're beginning to see more the shape of the magnetic field as it holds gas in place in what we call coronal streamers. You also notice in 2012 there were streamers really all around. So think of a porcupine bristling out in all, di uh, in all directions. Uh, and that's not what we will have this year. Uh, at an eclipse in 1868, uh, well, look in particular here in the yellow, uh, the Jules Jansen went to India looking in particular uh, for some of the sodium emission lines there. And what he found was an additional uh, yellow line that was so bright he thought he could even see it out of eclipse, uh, which worked out. And uh, Norman Lockyer, months later, also saw it out of eclipse. And eventually, they called it helium because it was known only on the sun. Uh, it took the chemists uh, uh, another couple of decades to catch up with the astronomers in realizing it was an element. And then the next year, uh, once they had helium, uh, they saw this green line here. And you can tell this is in the corona. This one is uh, really in, in the uh, chromosphere. In the corona, you can see this whole circle. So it's higher up. These are slitless spectra. The, uh, the uh, narrow brightness ring around the sun is its own slit. And so they called this coronium. And as you know, coronium did not turn out to be an element the way helium did. Uh, and it took until uh, around 1940 uh, when Ben Edlane, and then it was really realized by Hannes Alfein uh, that, uh, that this was from iron that has lost 13 of its normal 26 electrons. And you can imagine how hot it has to be to drive that many electrons off an iron atom. And the answer is uh, somewhere uh, uh, above a million uh, degrees. And there's also a coronal red line uh, here. And depending on the temperature of the corona, one or the other is stronger. Uh, and, uh, and we have been following the, the overall change in the coronal temperature over the sunspot cycle, the solar activity cycle, by the relative strengths of the uh, green line and the red line. Then we will again be uh, uh, housing some spectrographs uh, this, uh, this year uh, to continue those observations. That was the green line. Here's the red line. Here's the helium uh, plus a uh, couple of sodium lines. So these are D1 and D2. This is D3.
many people mistakenly think, as I've said already, that because we have coronagraphs in space, uh, we don't have to do eclipse observations. And that turns out not to be true. For one thing, the sun varies, as I said, so much from here to here that the coronagraphs in space cut off the inner uh, more than a, a solar radius here. And so this whole donut is left for us to study uh, at eclipses. And then we can tie it in with the space observations. And then we can look at the surface of the sun by looking at certain emission uh, lines in the ultraviolet, the far ultraviolet. And so here we've pasted a billion degree gas uh, uh, emission line image on what was otherwise the dark silhouette of the moon. But here is where we can do our, our, our main work in this whole uh, region of space uh, around the sun. We're very glad that the Parker Solar Probe next year is going to penetrate uh, down, uh, down close to that, uh, that region, uh, but only on specific paths. And, uh, and so there's, for the foreseeable future, we'll be getting interesting results uh, about the magnetic field, uh, especially as it constrains the hot gas uh, in that region. Um, now, uh, here uh, is one of our composite images from, uh, uh, from Australia uh, here. And you can see the, uh, the shapes of the magnetic field, the prominences, and, and I won't go into all the details. This is a projection of three-dimensional structure on a two-dimensional uh, uh, surface. So this is million degree gas held in space uh, by the magnetic field. And, uh, uh, and 35 minutes later, from a ship uh, in, off New Zealand, uh, they saw that a coronal mass ejection had gone out. And it really had gone 600,000 kilometers in about half an hour. So it's really going out at a million kilometers uh, an hour. And we don't know what eruptions there are. And this is another reason to keep uh, studying eclipses. We get, uh, we get different uh, views of the corona each time. The magnetic field is different. Eruptions uh, uh, may be different. And so we have the statistics that we want to build up by studying, uh, studying these things. And, and here you can just see an embossing technique uh, comparing the observations 38 minutes after that hour and 14 minutes in the next hour. So just over half an hour difference for this huge uh, eruption. The ones that go off to the side, incidentally, are not coming straight at us on Earth. But the ones that are you see as halos can be coming uh, right at us. And, and they can do a lot of damage to satellites and power lines and other things. So we want to know more about it. We also work with Zoran Mikic and John Linker of Predictive Science, um, who can make uh, predictions using an MHD uh, calculation based on the photospheric magnetic field. And then we, uh, and then we uh, can observe the, uh, the details um, at the eclipse and, uh, and feedback to improve the, uh, uh, the predictions. And again, we'll have a pre-eclipse prediction from them uh, this year by agreement. Yinmin Wang of the Naval Research Laboratory also uses, uh, makes predictions using a different technique. And, and again, we can, we can see the agreements and disagreements based on the, the surface magnetic field uh, that, uh, that he uses. We do have some wonderful spacecraft up the Solar Dynamics Observatory. A NASA spacecraft has one instrument measuring the magnetic field all the time. Uh, and then the uh, far ultraviolet observations showing the hot areas on the sun, which and the hottest areas, of course, uh, are above the, uh, the magnetic fields. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then the uh, helium uh, observation is cl uh, closer to the 50,000 Kelvin range than the million degree Kelvin range of, of the uh, uh, coronal uh, imaging. And what we can see is uh, tracing the origin of, of of eruptions on the surface of the sun. This was done with a European spacecraft uh, and a, what's called the SWAP, the Sun Watcher um, uh, instrument. And, uh, and we can see the eruption go through the region that they can't see with run grass from space and see how it evolves. This is a region in which the solar wind is formed. So there's a lot of in interesting and important activity goes on. And then we can follow it up through these couple of coronagraphs. And you can see how much is occulted here, and then even higher, the bigger uh, areas occulted. And even though we see these wonderful uh, pictures and we can make movies of these things, the uh, pixels that we have at the eclipse are about 10 times finer. So in the overlap region, we're seeing these same features, but uh, 10 times finer in each dimension. And again, we can make composites. In 2012, uh, we uh, had a, a pretty uh, 
uh, spherically symmetric uh, eclipse. And we have mapped, I'm not the one who went back to, uh, to the uh, 1901 with uh, the mapping. I haven't seen eclipses that long. But people <laughs> have been following the shape of the corona over, over time. And at the lower right, for those of you who can see it, we have the 2012 point with this very uh, axisymmetric uh, uh, eclipse. Um, and, uh, and so here is a composite image made of, of, uh, of dozens of individual uh, images with the best parts taken and put together to show the structure. And then we can line it up to the uh, coronagraph uh, structures uh, there. Uh, and mostly, we've been able to publish an astrophysical journal uh, each time on the imaging results and a solar physics a journal that we heliophysicists use, uh, especially for the, uh, uh, for the spectral observations uh, at each time. Um, and, I, and again, I, I want to stress that at 99% of the eclipse, the, what's in the sky is about 10,000 times <coughs> brighter than it is uh, totality. So all these things don't show in a 99% eclipse. You really have to be in, in totality. So uh, after 2012, there was an annular eclipse in 2013, also in, uh, in Australia. Um, and then the African uh, eclipse of 2013. The sun rose in Australia in some clouds, but cleared up above the clouds. Um, and, uh, and we had a nice annular eclipse. And you can see the effect on the Earth's atmosphere as the day begins to warm in the morning. Instead of continuing to warm, there's a deficit from the sunlight being shut off. And I work with the atmospheric physicist Marcos Peñaloza Murillo from the Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela, on studying the effect of the shock of the abrupt turnoff of sunlight. And this is not abrupt here, but I'll show you some more uh, temperature uh, graphs later. And that's another one of the things uh, of the things we do. The eclipse that went across um, Africa was a very narrow uh, totality. And we uh, got it in Gabon. Um, it just missed Prince of the Island, where uh, Einstein, where Eddington had done the famous experiment in, uh, in 1919. Uh, and I've just been invited to the opening of an uh, education park in Prince of the Island on the 100th anniversary of, uh, of, that, uh, of that eclipse, uh, which it, it turns out, well, OK. Um, so in any case, we were in Gabon. Uh, the partial phases extended. Uh, through uh, northern South America, even the east part of the United States, to Spain, southern, uh, southern France. But, but we wanted to be in totality. And then it got narrower and narrower and ended in East, uh, in east Africa. We were not able to go to right exactly the center line because the people told us we could be trampled by elephants there. Uh, so we did visit the elephants on, on the morning of the eclipse. But then we went actually to a village about 10 kilometers uh, south of the center of the center line. And we had a couple of different sites uh, free of elephant problems. Uh, here's uh, here's our, our group there. We were helped by the parks people from uh, Gabon. Uh, the local astronomical society had helped us. A lot. We spent a lot of time on, on logistics uh, there. Many of these people will be back. <laughs>
real time, that was a one minute eclipse. And you can see that there was plenty of time to look around, to take photographs, to make different, to walk around, to look through binoculars. Uh, and this year, the eclipse will be, depending on where you are, if you're on the center line, between two minutes in Oregon and two minutes and 40 seconds uh, in, uh, in Illinois. So there's plenty of time during that eclipse to do something. And in fact, there are a number of people who now choose to go uh, near the edge where you get only a minute of totality, but more time for the Bailey's beads and, and the diamond ring. Uh, so uh, that's something that we can discuss. But in any case, a minute before, the sky is blue. Uh, you don't see the, the corona. You just see a haze around scattering in the sky. And then during totality for those, that minute, in that occasion, you see the dark silhouette of the moon a bit oh, uh, and the overexposed corona around it with me uh, looking up. And on the horizon, you're looking out of the zone of totality and you can see some light scattered in and which it looks reddish for the same reason that a sunset is reddish. And then you can put together some dozens of, of your uh, images of different exposures and here we had a wonderful uh, coronal mass ejection there, some beautiful structure in the, magnetics, uh, in the magnetic field um, and, uh, and it wasn't quite as, uh, uh, as uh, round uh, for our point on the flattening uh, graph and we have spectra again whenever there's a Bailey's bead there diamond ring you get the continuum but here is the spectrum and you can see the green line here again stronger than the red line uh, given the, uh, uh, the close to solar maximum these are spectra from Aris Vulgaris from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki who will again be part of our team this year and uh, here is our image uh, this is an unprocessed image fit in with uh, um, the uh, swap image from uh, the European spacecraft in the middle and the uh, Naval Research Laboratory imaging outside. Look, there's beautiful coronal mass ejection and a bow shock around it, so there's lots of structure to, uh, uh, to study the, uh, the shapes of uh, holding the coronal magnetic field uh, in place. Milosov Druckmuller uh, from Slovakia is a computer scientist who specializes in, uh, in the techniques of, of seeing at high resolution. So we have these two coronal mass ejections. There was an erupting prominence here. Here's some reddish uh, chromosphere and, and uh, prominences. Uh, and then uh, my student, Tina Seeger, who's been working uh, in uh, GPS here uh, this year and will again uh, next year after she graduated from Williams College, put together some, some of our imaging from Gabon and other peoples from Gabon and Uganda and Kenya. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, so we can see uh, some, some of these uh, results as it, uh, as it went uh, across and see the details. Here's that bow shock uh, again there. Uh, and uh, uh, well, okay, there's supposed to be a GIF here which is not playing. So, so in any case, you're just seeing these comparisons. But we could actually see motion in the, uh, uh, in the coronal mass ejection and much higher resolution than from the space coronagraphs. Uh, and so here's our Eclipse uh, composite here and the uh, and, uh, C2 coronagraph image uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then you can see in, well, uh, and then there are various features we can pick out and study the, the, uh, the motions uh, in them and measure the velocities involved. And so we'll see what goes on. This eclipse, of course, each eclipse, as I said, is different. We don't know what it's going to be on August 21st. But here is a higher resolution. This is part of our overlap region. I mean, we're, our, observa our observing is not limited to that region. We, in a clear sky, we can see much further out, and there's an overlap region in which we just see finer resolution than they see from, uh, from space. Uh, but uh, the uh, coronagraphs themselves have the wonderful uh, dynamics that we, can, uh, that we can see. So we put it all together. Uh, again, Yunming Wang uh, made his, uh, up his predictions. Of, of the magnetic field, um, and, uh, and so we'll have those again this year. In 2014, there was no total eclipse of the sun. There were a couple of partial eclipses. In other words, the umbra did not hit the Earth. It went above or the North Pole or below the South Pole, and it was pretty spot free uh, facing the Earth on, in, in April. But by October, that we, when we had a meeting at the Sacramento Peak Observatory, there was the biggest sunspot group on the sun in, uh, in decades, and that was fun to see. It was visible with the, the uh, <laughs> naked, well, not quite naked eye, uh, but an unaided eye looking through a safe solar filter. 
So we're spending a lot of time getting all the ophthalmologists, medical boards on board with <laughs> statements from the American Astronomical Society about the safe observing. And we're, we've been trying to head off the blanket statements we've run in too often that, uh, that say it's never safe to look at the sun and even lock kids in school rooms, uh, in basement classrooms away from the sun. And uh, this uh, scares them. And they soon learn that it was an overwarning, and then they won't pay attention when you give them legitimate medical warnings. Um, so, uh, so I feel strongly that there's a lot of negativity that, that comes out of false warnings, and it's up to all of us to be as accurate as uh, we possibly can. And I've been, uh, spent a lot of time lecturing in schools of all grades, including Kids Club here in Pasadena, and my grandkids' uh, school in Monte Vista in, in uh, La Crescenta. And I, Hope um, uh, many of you will go out and lecture to uh, uh, schools of all ages uh, in the next, well, less than, less than a couple of months. Okay, well, we've lost something. <laughs> Let's see. All right, anyway, uh, here's the sunspot uh, graph. Uh, as of that time, so you see, we were on a, a peak of the sunspot cycle, but it was a low peak, half the height of the preceding cycle and about a third the height of the cycle before that. And we've had the SOHO uh, up all this time. Uh, NASA's trace was succeeded by the Solar Dynamics Observatory uh, back around 2009. Uh, and then Stereo, I'll say more about uh, this, the uh, NASA spacecraft that goes around uh, the uh, side of the uh, Earth's orbit. In 2015, the eclipse threaded its way up the uh, Arctic, missing most land, it hit the Faroe Islands on the edge here. Uh, and then uh, we observed from Svalbard, an archipelago, uh, controlled by Norway, until the eclipse uh, went up to the North Pole. In this case, we had to worry about polar bears, um, <laughs> although this was the only one we actually saw. Uh, but a tourist was mauled uh, uh, two days before the eclipse, and many people wrote to me for, uh, to make sure we were safe. And in fact, the rule is that you had to uh, have a rifle with you if you went more than two, and had rifle training if you went more than two uh, kilometers out of town. Uh, the uh, reindeer was somewhat more docile by the side of the road. It was very, very clear, and uh, we were upset the day before when it was clear, and we said, well, they used up their one clear day this year. <laughs> but it was clear the second day in a row. It was perfect, perfectly clear, and we could see the corona, we could see an eruption of prominences and other prominences. Uh, the longer exposures showed, uh, showed more corona, this uh, erupting prominence there. Uh, and here is a computer composite made of images uh, I made with my colleague Ron Dantowitz. Wendy Carlos makes these uh, composites. And, and uh, you can see this. there was some deficit in this quadrant. We're no longer as, uh, as uh, symmetric, but we could see the streamers very well. Uh, and we did have to go out of town because the sun was at 10 degrees and the mountains were 11 degrees. <laughs> so in fact, we couldn't stay in town. We had to go out, but not more than two kilometers because we didn't want to have to have rifles. And so, we were, <laughs> so we, were, uh, we were out on the ice. I'm going to play that one again if I can. It speeded up by 10 times. You can see the Umbra uh, flash by. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was beautiful on, on the amazing. ice. amazing. The light is changing. Look at the shadows. It's super strange. It's just getting very dark. This is absolutely incredible. We have a little sun like dog here. A minute, it's gonna go back. It is so dark. For those of you who, are, uh, who want to do some uh, wide-angle photography, it's, it's uh, fairly straightforward. Your cell phones do fine. Uh, and uh, I certainly know a lot of people, myself included, who will be making a lot of close-ups that you can have later. But we were out on the ice. Uh, here I am with a couple of cameras on that, uh, on that occasion. And my student, Allison Carter, uh, on the left, looking in the, in the direction of where the sun is going to come. 
uh, past, uh, past the mountains. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, Swap spacecraft uh, had an eclipse of the sun. You could see the detail of the coronal loops on the side, which is one of the things we'll be studying. And then, and then it went halfway around the Earth, and it had another, uh, another eclipse. <laughs> so that was fun. And, and, uh, and then uh, we did ask my, uh, my alumnus, Dan Seaton, to put together a movie of the month before and the month after so we can really see the evolution of the structures uh, in the sun. We're particularly interested in the limb structures. Uh, but, but you can see how that varies over, over time. And you could put our uh, uh, eclipse observations together with the, uh, the spacecraft observations. And then just the longer the exposure is, uh, the better uh, you can see outward. Uh, but uh, then it takes some computer techniques to put those together to make a composite. That, and the eye is a very good. Uh, observing device, and, and the eye sees something more akin to this, actually. I can work over quite a, a nice uh, dynamic range. Uh, the sunspot cycle at this time was uh, beginning to decline here in, uh, in 2015. It had had a very low cycle in 2008 to 2010. Even in 2006, you see, there were several years in there when there were no sunspots. The yellow is daily. There were no sunspots on the sun many days for a four-year period, and uh, we'll see what happens, uh, what happens this time. Uh, and, but here's the overall shape of the corona through several different methods of observing on that occasion. And Yunming Wang has his calculations not only from the front, but also from the sides, because NASA has sent stereo A, which means ahead, and stereo B, which means behind, to drift ahead or behind the Earth in its orbit to get side, uh, side views of the sun. Um, and, uh, and here's a composite with, with an individual photo tying together with the uh, coronagraph on the SOHO, uh, on the Soho spacecraft. Uh, but it really was uh, beautifully clear. And we have, have the prominences, erupting prominence, diamond ring effect uh, there uh, out on the ice here in uh, 2015. As the day uh, began, it warmed up all the way up to about 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, <laughs> and then the, uh, the sun started getting covered by the moon. And it got colder and colder and colder and went down to minus 7 uh, with, a, with some thermal lag in the atmosphere uh, and then resumed um, its uh, path when the sun became uncovered. So, if, so from where it would have been uh, down there, it's about a 16 degree drop. In, uh, in temperature on that occasion. We're measuring that carefully uh, at this eclipse, too. Uh, and I got only a minor bit of frostbite that the, uh, <laughs> during that. And here's my, my uh, team of colleagues here, student Allison Carter and uh, uh, Wojta Ruschen from Slovakia, and Radantowicz from Brookline, and uh, Aris Bulgaris, John Seridakis from Greece, Michael Zeiler from New Mexico, Michael Kentrianakis from New York, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it was uh, quite, quite something in, uh, in Svalbard. We were very pleased. Just an iPhone movie to show you what it was like. So you can do very well uh, with an iPhone. Glenn Schneider and Jeff Sims were aloft uh, watching the, the Umbra go by. So they had a lot of fun with that. Uh, in, uh, later in 2015, there was a partial eclipse uh, that was strongest in Antarctica. So I went as far south uh, uh, on Africa as was possible to Cape Algolhas at the south end of, of uh, South of Africa, which to my surprise is quite much further south than Cape Town. Um, and we had some clouds, but that's allowed for a partial eclipse. We allow them to have some clouds during, <laughs> during uh, partial eclipses. Of course, from space, from SWAP, there was no partial eclipse. And in fact, you can use the occasion of an eclipse to, uh, to calibrate the resolution of your uh, of your telescope, because we, we know about the sharpness of the advancing edge of the, of the moon. And on uh, uh, and this, and this occasion, you could see that the, uh, the moon was not going to cover the sun uh, uh, entirely. 
uh, in March 2016 was the last uh, total eclipse that we had, and it passed over Indonesia uh, and out into the Pacific um, here, uh, crossing the uh, equator. Uh, equator there, the cloudiness statistics were really pretty bad. Purple is bad on the on the main islands. We were over here in in, uh, in Ternate, uh, and here's the uh, the uh, Ernie Wright's uh, simulation from the Goddard Space Flight Center, the projection of the moon uh, the, uh, with a dark part of its shadow uh, and the uh, penumbra, the lighter part of its shadow, coming across uh, Borneo and Ternate was right here as it went out into the Pacific where it did cross one small uh, atoll. And so we can see the uh, 0, 20, 40, 60, 80 partial eclipse uh, zones come across as then the umbra appeared, uh, first spread out to be elliptical from its rejection around the Earth and went across Sulawesi, and here's where we were in Ternate and out into the uh, Pacific where it did cross this Walea uh, Atoll, and a team from the Exploratorium uh, in San Francisco was, uh, was there. Um, so, uh, so we did have uh, two and three quarter minutes or so of, uh, of occultation there. Um, the uh, sunspot number had declined even, even further, um, and we were able to see all the eclipse phenomena through, uh, through a relative hole in the clouds, though through some haze. So it was not ideal conditions, but we still could see uh, all the eclipse uh, phenomena, including totality uh, there. So we do what we can. And here's just a series of observations. You begin to see clouds at the longer exposures, but here's a composite put together for us by Wendy Carlos. There are coronagraphs on Earth. This is from the best one, which is the so-called K-coronagraph of the High Altitude Observatory, the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory. And uh, so it blocks out the very lower corona, and then with polarization measurements, it can see some part of the corona, and you can see that that is not at all as good as we can get during an eclipse. So we, we can get some daily observations this way, and they're useful, but you do want to do what you can uh, during, uh, during an eclipse. And, and here's just uh, cleaning up the K coronagraph observation. You can see the structure of that part of the inner corona, except not the very lowest level. The temperature uh, rose. It was uh, a lot warmer than Svalbard. Here's 78 degrees. It went up to 84. Leveled off instead of rising for the rest of the day. Uh, and then uh, it was level for a while, then uh, dipped to 82, except there was one point missing at the middle of totality. And uh, I asked the person I had taking observations every five minutes, and she went back to her notes and said, oh, it says, too dark to read the thermometer. <laughs> Here it is in Celsius. Uh, and, uh, and so the corona was not as uh, strong uh, at, uh, at that time. We do have the observations from, uh, from space, uh, from SWAP, uh, where, where they had some uh, series of uh, partial eclipses. Uh, and uh, so it depends on the orientation. We're obviously not able to change the orbit of the, uh, uh, of the spacecraft, uh, but we can calculate in advance uh, when, uh, how much eclipse we, uh, we will have. And we're expecting one more. There we go. From the X-ray telescope on the Hinode spacecraft, uh, they, uh, they had a, a good uh, occultation, a, a good eclipse here, with the, the hottest gas that uh, shows in x-rays, uh, pretty, pretty well covered by the moon. It's a real phenomenon. Oops, let me go, let me go back there. This is just a weather satellite view. Um, you can really see the umbra across the Earth. 
and we certainly will have images like that uh, this August 21st with, uh, with weather satellites above the United States. Stereo was off to the side. Here's Stereo front on one side here with its coronagraph. Um, you can see how much is occulted, and they, and they have uh, views of the uh, ultraviolet, far ultraviolet of the structure on the side of the sun, including uh, large parts that we can't see from Earth. And you can see that at that time, Stereo A and Stereo B were more or less on the opposite side of the, uh, of the sun from the, uh, from the Earth. Uh, I did uh, want to, sometimes I have my celestial buddies uh, that I take to, um, well, I took it to Kids Club in Pasadena, uh, but I take it to, to grown-up audiences too. And on this occasion, I'm not using my celestial buddies, uh, I'm using Michelle's celestial buddies from KISS. <laughs> so I was glad to see that KISS has its own set of celestial buddies, and so I want to emphasize that, that this, is, um, uh, this is a solar eclipse, when the moon is blocking the sun from hitting the earth. And this is a lunar eclipse. Oops, thank you. You can be my assistant. Hold that up. When, when the moon uh, goes into the earth's shadow for a lunar eclipse, uh, and then this is an apocalypse. <laughs> or would be. Uh, uh, anyway, in September, there was an annular eclipse that went across. So we could go back with lights again, please. An annular eclipse that went across Africa, with the peak over here, and we went out into the uh, Indian uh, Ocean, uh, past Madagascar, uh, and the cloudiness statistics again, and we went to a small island of uh, Réunion, which is the département of, of uh, France, uh, here where we had some three minutes of annular uh, eclipse, and you can just see that the moon is not going to be big enough to cover the sun, leaving that annulus of uh, photosphere, um, so it doesn't get very dark. Still interesting to do, and it's also interesting for practicing uh, with our cameras for what we're going to do during the total eclipse, making sure everything uh, everything works. So here's some composites one of my students uh, put uh, put together of the the partial phases and the annular phase there. Um, and, uh, uh, and he was a double major in astrophysics and studio art. <laughs> uh, and we have these pinhole images, and people keep talking about pinhole cameras. I think they're kind of outmoded in a day when you can buy filter material for, uh, in quantity. Uh, my uh, daughter bought a thousand for 15 cents each uh, for distributing in the schools in, in Monte Vista, and you could buy single ones for, for a dollar. So the pinhole camera. Uh, it's not really necessary, but you can look under a tree and see the pinhole images. The people who don't know what a total eclipse is think that, a, that a, an annular eclipse is, is magnificent, and a, a total eclipse, as we'll have on August 21st, will be even that much more magnificent. The last eclipse went across, was an annular eclipse that went across Chile and Argentina uh, in, in February and over to, and over to Africa with partial phases for the lower half of South America and, and the lower part of Africa and, 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 uh, and Antarctica. And we went to Patagonia in Argentina. Here I am with those cameras that you may uh, recognize. Uh, the people had various kinds of uh, filters. I want to keep the, my laser pointer out of their eyes. <laughs> but, uh, but here are the, uh, the, the glass filters. And, but I like the filter cards, in which it's clear you have to hold them up and you don't wear them all the time, although they are safe to wear all the time. And you can mount the card in a bigger thing and keep it around your neck, uh, et cetera. And notice the beautiful blue sky uh, that, we had, uh, that we had then. And we had a beautiful annular eclipse in Patagonia on, on that time. And you could see the beads and annularity. Some people went to the edge of the path instead of right in the center and were even able to see the chromosphere and a little bit of corona. Uh, from the edge. So that's a bit of a feat, uh, but, but, it can be, uh, but it can be done. Uh, here's the swap uh, image on, uh, on that occasion, and, uh, uh, and the sun remains very interesting to see with, with uh, a few active regions uh, at this point in the solar activity cycle and the coronal loops that we like to study. Uh, one of the things that we will be studying at this eclipse is the variations in the coronal loops uh, and, and just getting a power spectrum and, and seeing 
uh, how that helps us distinguish between models of coronal heating, how the magnetic field heats the corona to millions of degrees. There's an, uh, an ultraviolet uh, instrument on SWAP that measures uh, Lyman alpha, for example, and you can see the, the drop in ultraviolet intensity uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the eclipse. In the meantime, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is studying the sun in a variety of ultraviolet <coughs> wavelengths, uh, and, and we can see the features uh, evolve. And here we are on, on Eclipse Day, Corona Hall, uh, here, some active, some active regions. Uh, you could actually see the effect here, South America, Tierra del Fuego. You could actually see a darkening uh, here from the shadow uh, going across uh, South America, and we'll be seeing that again. Well, where we were is actually related to studies of the new, uh, to be made from the New Horizon spacecraft, which you all know went by Pluto and Charon in July 14, uh, uh, 2015, because. Um, it is now heading towards an object called 2014 MU69, uh, where it will get on New Year's Day in 2019. And the, uh, prediction, the prediction was for June 3rd for an occultation to take place around here. So I've recently come back from Argentina, <coughs> where we at NASA had sent uh, 60 uh, people with 24 telescopes, <coughs> half to South Africa and half to Argentina, uh, to try to pinpoint the, uh, the object and to see how big it is so they can set their exposure time. There's another event on July 10th for which the 100-inch uh, telescope on NASA's Sophia airplane is going to fly. And then on July 27th, there's another event that uh, goes across Patagonia, pretty much where we were. So we have some connections that we've been able to help with, uh, with people uh, who were with us at the, uh, uh, at the uh, eclipse in uh, February. So we're looking forward to these to pinpointing MU69 more and to helping NASA set their exposures and to check for debris in the field. Here we are in, <laughs> in South America <laughs> observing MU69. Here I am with my student Mujo, Mujo Lo in, in, the, uh, in the southern sky on the 3rd of June uh, a few weeks ago. So anyway, uh, Ernie Wright has been showing uh, again what, what happens, the shadow of the uh, moon of falling on the Earth, and here it's going to come across uh, the uh, continental United States. Um, um, and then it reaches noon in southern Illinois, in Carbondale, Illinois, and then continues through part of North Carolina and out to sea at, uh, uh, at, south, uh, at south Carolina there, and with a new calculation showing right at the coast the Atlantic coast, it, it may not be quite as cloudy as uh, further, uh, as further inland, and then it ends, of course, at uh, at sunset, um, with the moon quite far from the Earth compared to the relative, <coughs> compared to the relative sizes. The uh, path uh, includes partial phases for uh, into Siberia, but all of Alaska, all of Hawaii, all of the United States, Canada, Greenland. Uh, and down into northern uh, South America. Uh, it reaches the uh, afternoon in South Carolina, which is why thunderstorms can build up and cloudiness can build up. We're going to get it here in, uh, in Oregon, where we have, uh, we're sacrificing some seconds, uh, but the cloudiness statistics are much more favorable here than they, uh, than they are here. Um, and well, um, and uh, so Jay Anderson, the meteorologist, um, has done the statistics from satellite maps, and uh, and that's and many people, a hundred thousand, they say, are going to the small town of Madras, Oregon, for that, uh, be, because of that, which of course they can't tolerate a hundred thousand people there at all. We're going to go to Salem, Oregon, which is uh, not that much worse in terms of, of statistics, but we have facilities, in particular on the campus of Willamette University, the electricity, the internet, and things we need to run a successful expedition. I'm very pleased to have support from the Solar Terrestrial Program of the National Science Foundation and the Committee for Research and Exploration of the National Geographic Society for my scientific uh, work. And, and of course, we have a lot of other friends and family coming with us too. But here's the cloudiness statistics for August. Uh, and you see this is a favored area compared to, uh, compared to that area with the somewhat middle in the middle part of the country. So you do want to be in this band, and we're going we're going with the statistics. Uh, 
Jay Anderson has separated the morning and the afternoon statistics. So, so there's a lot of, uh, to be studied. And of course, uh, we'll have detailed weather <laughs> <laughs> uh, st uh, statistics. Um, uh, we'll have detailed weather forecast a few days in, uh, in advance. How am I doing? Yeah, so I'm just ending he uh, here now. Um, so as you see, it was clear almost all across the country. In the uh, there, was, there were some clouds here, uh, but they're pretty clear. Um, and the new spacecraft goes R is up with a solar telescope uh, in, uh, at the panels pointing in the sun. In, in which it takes uh, six different filters at different, at different temperatures. I'm skipping uh, ahead now just to get to the very end, which I almost add a bigger field of view. Um, and uh, here are some new images with this new NOAA NASA, uh, NASA spacecraft in, a, in all its different filters. Uh, so we look forward to those results. We're down in the sunspot cycle, continuing, uh, continuing to go uh, down, down, down. So we'll see what's on the sun. Uh, on, August, uh, on August 21st. Uh, at the moment on the sun, this is a, uh, a few days ago, there were just a couple of active, uh, of active regions in one hemisphere. But we expect a solar minimum corona extended at the equator, and then we'll be able to see the polar plumes. So we'll be able to study the polar plumes that have been otherwise hidden uh, for the last few years at, uh, at solar maximum. And again, we're testing the models of coronal heating. I don't have time to discuss that right now, but we'll be making these kinds of of, ob of observations looking for oscillations in the coronal loops and measuring the uh, periods and the power spectrum of the, uh, of the periods at, at, the, at, uh, solar, uh, at solar minimum. So we can study these in various ways. And the path uh, will go across the United States. Um, and I think I'm out of time. So I will just uh, stop with this map by the map maker, Michael Zeiler. And, uh, and ask for questions if Michelle allows a little time for questions.